Good morning, welcome. Today is the first Sunday after Trinity. In the many weeks that follow Trinity Sunday, it gives us the opportunity to reflect on how we should live out our faith together in the world, building community in ways that reflect the nature of God, the God who is relationship. In this way, our understanding of the Trinity is earthed in the messy, ordinary reality of our lives, the practical caring for our neighbour and our reaching out to those beyond our church community. Our opening prayer. We come before you, gracious God, just as we are. We come with our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. We come with our fears and apprehensions. We come with faith and doubt. We come to offer and receive. We come to you, the King of love, in the name of your Son and in the power of your Spirit. Amen. The Collect of the Day. God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers and, because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you, both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Then Jesus summons his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the Twelve Apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Growing up in the 60s and early 1970s, one of our favorite TV programs at home was the black and white minstrel show. It was hugely popular light entertainment, and as a family, we rarely missed it. The artists in the show put on blackface. So even while it was in the middle of its phenomenally successful 20 year run, more and more people began to say it was racist and perpetuated ethnic stereotypes. I never thought of it in such terms at the time, of course, and by watching it, I do not think it somehow made me believe that I was superior to people of colour. But today the show is, quite rightly, considered to be an embarrassment. The death of George Floyd at the hands of officers of the Minneapolis police force has sent shockwaves round the world and, despite the pandemic, has sparked widespread street protests in numerous countries across the globe, including here in Ireland. This has been a rude awakening for us all 
And I'm sure many of us have spent some time in recent days reflecting on what has been happening. Maybe we've even asked ourselves, how do I instinctively react when I see a person of colour? What sort of thoughts come into my mind? Do I, despite my best intentions, revert to stereotypes? Although I'm sure none of us consider ourselves to be racist, have there been moments when we have been more than a little unnerved, even shocked, by some of those thoughts and instincts? As part of the current anti-racism protests, there have been calls to remove statues of historical figures who made their fortunes through their involvement in slavery or who were known racists. Some older television programmes and even well-known films have been removed from media platforms because, like the black and white minstrel show, they too are now deemed to be racist and an embarrassment. I am not sure that's the way we should be going. We cannot airbrush out those bits of history that are now deemed to be unacceptable. Instead, we've got to learn from our history so we do not make the same mistakes again. If we do not know that history, how can we change for the better? There was a time not that long ago when the Bible was used by some Christians to justify slavery and the appalling treatment of people of colour who were routinely demeaned, exploited and brutalised. Does that mean we should destroy every copy of the Bible to make sure no one misinterprets it in that way again? Where do we draw the line? Many years ago I was given a gift by some young adult parishioners in Carlo after they'd been on an educational trip to Kenya. It was a depiction on cloth of the disciples around the table at the Last Supper. All the disciples in the picture are black. Naturally, that is how the African artist would have visualised them. It hangs on my study wall to this day. For me, it is symbolic of the universality and inclusiveness of the Christian message. We often forget that while Jesus may not have come from Africa, he was without doubt a person of colour. In June 2020, Christians believe that reports of Jesus' resurrection should still be changing humanity's understanding of the world. Those in power, from the politicians to the police, often wear the clothes of Christianity, waving a Bible in the name of politics. Behind all their talk and posturing remains a perfectly functioning system that plunders both the poor and the earth itself, that maintains, as one academic has written, a glass ceiling painted white above the efforts of persons of colour in the United States and around the world. For the first century disciples, the times were no less oppressive. The people were terrified. The authorities were panic-stricken. So much so, in their insecurities, they had judged Jesus and his movement in Israel to be a threat. Do not forget that as Matthew's narrative began, the authorities were so alarmed at the rumours of Jesus' peace that they'd had children killed. But now they perceive the threat clearly. The transforming work of Jesus heals, restores, and reconciles. This is not acceptable in an us-against-the-world system. In our reading this morning, Jesus tells his disciples, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Those words could so easily be misunderstood, especially in the light of the recent anti-racism protests. Is Jesus being racist here? in telling them not to go near named ethnic groups and people of particular nationalities. Of course not. His is a global mission, but that mission must begin first in our own communities. The scene recorded in Matthew's Gospel before the resurrection makes explicitly clear that the wolves are not just out there among the Gentiles. Here, Jesus is saying that among the children of Israel, among the people of God, among our tribe are those who are lost. We must never be tempted to think that racism is something restricted to the United States of America. It is everywhere. It exists much closer to home. 
it can be too close to home. God is calling for those who will offer Christ-like compassion on the harassed and helpless. The spirit of the risen Jesus gives his true followers authority to overcome the evil that crouches at our doorstep. It does not matter what perspective you are taking on current events, these are chaotic days. God needs to utilize a great variety of gifts and skills and experiences to carry out the continuing business of proclaiming the good news to those who do not know God and for carrying out the imperatives of the gospel, loving our neighbors as ourselves, bringing about justice and peace, providing for those in need. Jesus delighted in taking ordinary, everyday people, those who did not seem to possess great qualifications or credentials, and calling them to become his disciples. He does the same for us, and the Holy Spirit makes available to us all, all that we need to be successful as we remain faithful to Jesus and his mission. As our lockdown eases, we face big questions about how we want to live. Whether we go back to the old normal or whether we work to create a new normal. A society that is more just, more inclusive, more equitable in its distribution of wealth and opportunity. In so many ways, we are now at a crossroads. We face choices as to which route we now want to take. What will our response be? with us in our troubles, yet we sometimes cannot find you. We've walked through time together and have considered our own place and our own lives, and so now we come before you. We know our faults and problems. We know the way we live and work, the way we are part of our communities and this parish. Awaken us anew. Cause our spirits to stir and arise. Help us to know your forgiveness and your love and bring us to repentance as our own grateful response. Talk to us in the silence of our hearts and may we find you again as the one who is all in all, the one for whom we live, the source of all our being and the reason we are here. Open our hearts again, we pray. Amen. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for you reveal your love to us through our families and friends. We learn of your care and protection through the good and grace of our loved ones. Teach us to learn to love as you love us. We rejoice in the family of the church. May all who come find love and fellowship. Lord, help your church be an instrument of peace and healing in the world. We pray for unity amongst Christians, that they may show that unity to the world. We praise you, O God, for the wonderful variety of people and talents. We ask your blessing on all areas of growth and goodness and grace. Lord, guide all those who influence the minds of young people. We pray for those who work in the media and in the pop culture of today. We give thanks for all that enriches and encourages family life. Lord, bless our homes with your love and care. We pray for the social services and all who support any families who are in difficulty. We remember before you families burdened by debt, unemployment, stress, or where love is absent. 
We give thanks that you are a God who heals and restores, that you care for our whole being, body, mind, or spirit. We remember in your presence all who have been injured in accidents or through acts of violence, all who have been taken ill, and those whose illness has no cure. We pray for their well-being and the knowledge of your love. Lord, bless all who share in healing. We pray for our doctors and nurses and all who work in our hospitals and nursing homes. Lord, extend our vision. May we look beyond what we see to the eternal. We pray for all who see you in that glory, which is beyond measure. As we remember with thanksgiving, loved ones, now departed. Dear God, in our efforts to dismantle racism, we understand that we struggle not merely against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, those institutions and systems that keep racism alive by perpetuating the lie that some members of the human family are inferior and others superior. Create in us a new mind and heart that will enable us to see brothers and sisters in the faces of those divided by racial categories. Give us the grace and strength to rid ourselves of racial stereotypes that oppress some of us whilst providing entitlements to others. Help us to create a church and a nation that embraces the hopes and fears of oppressed people of colour where we live, as well as those around the world. Heal your family, O Lord, and make us one with you, in union with our brother Jesus, and empowered by your Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord of all, you call us to follow you into an unknown future. The way ahead is puzzling. We sometimes cannot see the direction we should take for our own lives, for the life of our church, or for the life of our world. Lord of all, when the chaos begins to subside, teach us to trust in your still, small voice. Teach us to listen for the whisper that urges us to change, to pay attention to your guidance and your love for us. Teach us to look and to see where you are already at work. Teach us not to look for opportunities to be heroes, but spaces where we are asked to be faithful in meeting the needs in front of us. Lord of all, may we believe in your promise that you will use what we have and what we are to feed the hungry and the lost, Help us to trust that you will make what is ordinary extraordinary by your presence. Amen. Jesus sent the disciples to proclaim the gospel, to cure the sick, to raise the dead, to welcome the outcasts, to cast out demons. Jesus calls us to do the same. Lord, help us to be your disciples. Go to serve, go to love, go to bring healing, go to bring peace. Go in the strength of the Father, go in the power of Jesus, go united by the Spirit, go and know his grace. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and